So, Neil and Rob, thanks so much for joining us today. I have the, the welcome opportunity to um, have the chance to learn from the projects that you two have, have been involved with and something that is so core to the theme of where are we going as DAM and museums, DAM and GLAMP, and that is Legacy Unlocked. Well, we have some specifics that we'll be hearing from Terentia about uh, what a great a kind of opening billboard for the changes that we're witnessing in our field. Neil, you've been at the center of much of this. I'm quite appreciative of it. And I'm going to turn this over to to the two of you. And thanks so much. Thanks, David. Um, and let's add uh, Rob into the stream, too, because um, we're really happy to be with everyone today. And uh, we want to encourage questions along the way. We have some polls as well um, coming out um, for during our session. Essentially, what we're calling this is a conversation. Um, it's really just going to be about Lego and records, as you can see, between Rob and I. Um, and so really, that's all we're going to be talking about. Today. No, no, I'm just playing about it. Um, ironically, I'm in Canada uh, where there's zero snow. Rob's in London where there is actually a major snowstorm. Uh, what's the irony of that, Rob, today? Um, between it all. Yeah, De definitely rolls reverse there. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Before we begin, just a couple of things about Terencia really quickly. Um, you know, we, we really believe in empowering cultural institutions. We only serve the larger GLAMP community and that's it. So we don't sell to our platform to other organizations. And that's because we're really trying to become this next generation platform to help manage your collections, organize and preserve the assets and, and help you really tell these amazing compelling stories. Today, I just wanted to highlight a couple of, of our of our community, the moat who will be coming up shortly um, uh, with Jamie and Alex. I encourage you to go to their session as well as um, Haley at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. What a fantastic presentation she has. Art Gal of Hamilton, um, we just actually launched a case study there for small museums. Um, and if you want to, you can see that case study in our um, exhibit hall. Our vision is all about how do we manage discover, engage, and trade. These should be four kind of things that we think about our dams platforms doing for us today. How do we have all of these kind of activities that go on with it? And that allows this extensibility in our platform through these kind of core services and, and integrations. We don't build everything. Um, in fact, that's what our whole partnership with knowledge integration is about. Why would we? Um, and it's very important for us to integrate these kind of technologies in where we can. But this is actually when we think about um, our wheel is what we should be thinking about when it comes to how our assets, our records should be serving us in our cultural institutions. I, I won't go too deep into this collaborative approach and fully configurable, but, you know, that is our whole process is to try to avoid big professional services. But I did just want to touch upon that all of our systems are a dedicated environment to you. We can deploy both on our um, our uh, hosted environment or yours, which means that there's no mixing of client data. And no matter where you are in the world, we can ensure that you have data sovereignty. Um, today, we're also really proud to be announcing our new small museum initiative. We're really trying to take a significant step towards addressing smaller museums and cultural institutions' unique needs um, with it. Today, we've heard some amazing stories, but most of them are from very large cultural institutions. And so what we want to also do is, while serving them, we also wanted to try and find a way to serve others. Um, you can find out more about that on our exhibition page to sign up to hear more or email us at info at trencia.io. Mention this and we can, we can arrange a discussion with it. Okay. Poll number one, because we like polls, right? So poll number one, let's go ahead and, and say, get that one going in live. And the first poll that we want to know is, do you know if your collection system has an API? Um, I think that's now published. So we're starting to see some answers coming in, which is really good. Rob, this is a perfect time for me to introduce who the heck is knowledge integration? Thanks, Neil. Uh, well, we've basically been around for 25 years uh, this year, so happy birthday to us. Um, happy we've birthday. Been, thank you. We've been involved in the cultural sector all that time, originally from a library background, but it's always been around connecting people and systems with the data that they're looking for and making people's lives as easy as possible when it comes to finding and retrieving that information. 
So basically, at the same as Neil, we work with the cultural sector. We're used to working with cultural sector data. Uh, I put in all in all its beauty, exclamation mark. So if you like, that kind of means we understand that most institutions think their data is in some way imperfect, um, and we'll always strive to make it better. But we're used to working in that in that environment with data of that type. And we basically make sure that that data ends up working for the institution in the locations that they need it. So in terms of how we go about that, um, we basically uh, 15 years ago uh, created a a middleware product called SIM uh, specifically for the cultural sector. Um, We didn't actually name it. It stands for uh, Cultural Information Integration Middleware, and it was the Museum of London that actually named it because we built it originally for them. Um, But it is basically a product uh, to to facilitate the requirements that I said earlier. It's about moving data around and working for the institution. Um, I'll leave it at that and move back to you, Neil. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. All right, so we got our first poll answers up. Uh, with it, and it turns out that 51.8% uh, know if their collection system has an API, and 48.2% um, do not know if their if their solution has one. So, what's the problem here, right? Um, if it doesn't have one, or even if it does, I, I think at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is connect all this metadata and assets to get a better picture. I couldn't resist it. You know, the collections. We, we're trying to create these seamless connections between objects makers and the digital systems we're always running into these issues right do we have the api and even if you do you know what is it what do we do when we don't have one um collection systems are object based right asset management systems are well asset based it's in the name right we also build these integrations either ourselves or we ask one of the vendors usually the damn vendor to do this but what cost and uh, doing it over and over again, and as you upgrade or you change things, they're always constantly changing all the time with it. And so let's talk about APIs and who do we have best here to do this is then what I'm going to call the king, no pun intended, thanks to London, the king of APIs, Rob. Rob, what is an API? There's actually been a couple of questions asked about it. Okay. So it, uh, in technical terms, it actually stands for application programming interface. But what that kind of means is it's a way of uh, – back office systems exposing their data so that it can be shared, it can be queried, um, and it can be used to move data around. Now, the the problem with the kind of general definition is that just having an API doesn't necessarily mean that it will work with the environment that you want to work in, that it will have the data in it that you want. Um, obviously, APIs are different across lots of different systems. So, you know, just because the system has an API, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to necessarily work uh, for you and with you. Um, you know, they may be designed not for real time queries or they may not respond quickly enough or, uh, you know, in, to be able to move that data around. Obviously, not all systems have them, but most people have requirements to integrate their data. And so you end up with this system where you'd like to use an API, but even if it's there, it's not necessarily the right API. It doesn't necessarily do the right job or contain the right information. And then what you do when the system doesn't have one, you kind of have to work around that and go to the core databases or data behind the scenes. So kind of just because it's got one doesn't mean it's right for the job. And there are approaches that you can take even if the system doesn't have them. And that's the kind of thing that we've been doing for the last 20 years. Um, Basically, I couldn't resist putting that in. Who are you going to call? Uh, that was this. This basically is a slide just to show it's not necessarily designed for bedtime reading, but it's just the fact that we're used to working with all of the systems, all of the data, and bringing it all together. That's, That's quite a heck of a number of systems that you have there that you've been able to pull data from for them. And for those, uh, Rob, I'm not sure if you see the chat. Charlene, I love it. I, um, it sounds like your system doesn't have an API, and right now you are the API. That's yeah. hilarious. Uh, next time we'll put up. Next time we'll put up a picture of you, Charlene, if you don't mind, um, with it. Um, so poll number two. Uh, are you ready? Uh, here we go. Poll number two is your collection systems and dams integrated today? Um, so here's your chance to vote. I feel like we should have some music here. Uh, that comes along with them. So we're starting to get some of those answers in. You know, it's it's nice to see it go up and down. Um, as we're bringing in those, you know, the traditional way, we were trying to think about, Rob and I kind of thought, how do we think about ways that we can describe a, a traditional kind of integration? 
in this way, we have a client, you know, system, um, whatever it is, that collections management system in which you're extracting the data and then you store it into the dams. A traditional, why we call it a point to point. But what happens, of course, Rob, is that then you end up with suddenly wanting to put more things into the dam or try to put more things in the dam and connecting it to the archives. Um, maybe you have other sources of digital assets or, or other data that you're trying to do. And now you're constantly trying to do that and maybe even transform it. But as you switch things out or as things change or as an upgrade takes place, you're now having to redo each one of those interfaces over and over and over again. And if it's actually possible to support, then you may want to actually bi-directional synchronization. Now we know that this is where it really, the rubber really hits the road where that's getting very complicated and not of a lot of collections management systems actually allow for that to happen. Uh, Rob, when you know, almost 70%, 69.6% says that they are not integrating at all and only 30% are integrating. And for those 30%, I applaud you because that's not really, easy to do, um, unless, of course, you're working with perhaps knowledge integration. Um, um, on this, let's go with the third poll, because this is the fun one. The third poll being is how long did it take, uh, right? Was it a month, a last, less than a year? I love it. Most people are still working on it. I guess for those who for those who are doing the still working, it'd be no great to know how long you've been working on it. And feel free to throw it in the chat. I'm going to tell you my record right now um, uh, that I heard a story uh, way back when was that it was 18 months to get a dam in a collections management system uh, uh, to talk to each other. If anybody can beat that uh, score of 18 months, I'd love to love to hear about that um, from it. So our approach is to change things a little bit. Our approach is to think about this as all of the source data, whether it's from collections, libraries, archives, Airtable, Excel, anything, being able to come in through the SIM, of which Rob's going to talk a little bit more, uh, more and have this ongoing data harvesting. Because then you have a, it's a, like a bus system in which we're able to bring this in, that we can transform that data, store, enhance it using machine learning, or add, adding additional catalog records. Uh, cataloging into it. Plus, we could also prevent you from doing it. And that's a key thing is that in Trencia, if it's from another source, we could actually lock it down so that that original source data can never be edited. It would need to be edited in its original source um, and then put it out for content aggregation, business intelligence. Rob, tell us about how the SIM harvesting approach works. Okay, thanks, Neil. I, I think the, the key point that you made was the difference between point to point and a hub. So the, the, the thing is that when you've got a point to point integration, you t you, you're kind of just working with each data source as you see it at that particular moment in time. You're not, not necessarily thinking about how you might want to use it more widely, how you might want to share it more widely within the organization. And obviously, every time you do an integration, then you have to write a new integration for a new system to every system that's going to use that data. And you end up with this massive spider of uh, data uh, connections that are a nightmare to keep up to date. Within the context of the SIM, the approach we take is the SIM is like a, a data hub, brings all the content in together, uh, keeps it up to date, synchronizes it. Um, the data is brought in on configurable schedules based on all of the systems it can talk to. That can range from things like diary systems to uh, archive authority data. Um, and then basically on that schedule, it runs, it looks what's changed. Um, it works out what effect, what effect those changes have. And then it synchronizes to all the target systems, to the dams and allows the dams to kind of make use of that data. And I think it's kind of interesting that um, in terms of the poll and 70% not having an integration, that kind of means as well that there'll be uh, more often than not, there'll be some degree of hand double data entry. You know, you'll be hand copying the, the data across and that'll gradually get out of date through time. And then you'll end up with people using the dams, potentially searching for data where the data's changed in the source system. So one of the key things about this approach is continuous integration so that changes are made in the source systems, the dams is up to date, and what you're looking for and the information you're using to search within that dams is completely and utterly up to date and it's reference quality data and you can work out what it is you're going to use. So people are getting that you know the cultural sector is not always great. You know, one of it, its biggest asset 
is the is its people and its data, and yet it's not necessarily the best sector for making use of it itself. So I think the key takeaway for me, and I've obviously been doing this for quite a long time, is that is that making the data work for you and making sure it's up to date is key within the uh, you know uh, uh, to allowing people to work to their potential, but also make use of the data. Thanks very much. Over to you, Neil, again. No, that's great, Rob. That's great. I, I think that's you You really kind of nailed it. And, and then it comes down to what about if you want to get it back? Now, let's get this yeah. fourth and last pull up. But before we do, Rob, I don't know if you saw it. Only 2.8% said a month or less out of 36. Nobody said one to three months. Three to six was about 14%. At least a year, 16.7, 66.7 at I'm um, still working on it. Um, and a couple of people felt that 18 months sounded quick uh, <laughs> in terms of things to do uh, with it. Uh, why don't we launch that fourth poll up now and uh, and find out for those, is it bi-directional or one-directional? I think another really interesting one for us to hear about with it, because one of the key things is there's probably going to be stuff where you may want to transform some of that data and have ongoing data synchronization. And that's where, again, you know, we're, we're really fortunate to be working with the SIM in order to be able to, and Rob and in, in knowledge integration, to be able to do that. Um, some of the difficulties, though, of course, that we all run into, right? And right now, by the way, it looks like it's a 50-50 split on one directional and bi-directional. Um, I realize with the poll, it's probably hard to come all the way down to those who didn't even have an API all the way through to where we are um, on it. But it's still interesting to see um, within it. Um, so how do we get collection data and assets really talking the same language, right? Um, and we call this because they are really two languages. And it's really unfortunate. Collection organizations put a lot of time and effort into describing these objects and artifacts. And, and while some of the collection systems will say they have dams capabilities, we know they're lightweight, you know, they with in asset management life cycles aren't really strong. They have very limited file sizes and there's no connection to the rest of the stuff, uh, the, the assets or systems in their organizations at all. Traditionally, dams have no concept, if you will, of the object, right? Except for maybe the asset itself or a maker or any other authority records. They, they don't understand the background supporting entities are needed. That traditional way, as we just described, that point to point of synchronizing is to pull the collections data to the dam. But now you're going to have to duplicate the collections information like 10 times over or 100 times over and then manage that ongoing synchronization. So if you will, right, if, if it's the object title or maker information or date or anything about it, you're having to use the API and then the API is to figure out either a way to constantly put it across or the other thing that we hear is, ah, forget, I'm not even going to do it through the API. And that's why I always need all this bulk editing capabilities within our within your dams so that what you're doing is trying to manually, Rob, as you pointed out earlier, manually trying to update information like the makers, uh, perhaps their, their year of death or something, and then bulk update against all of those records. Does that sound common to everybody? I would hope so, right, for those who are doing it. Well, at Trencia, we're trying to solve this problem differently. Our model is to synchronize a relevant subset of your collections data into a dam, such as our platform, that understands the concept of an object or a maker record or an archive record or a publication record to hold it once and ease the process of keeping it sync. And so in this case, we're kind of flipping the script on it by bringing in the object record through the API. And thanks to you know, the SIM, we're able to do this to recreate a, an object record that is locked down. It's not editable, although you could add additional fields of information. And now you can easily have one record that is attaching to all of the different types of assets. And these are just a few examples of them, of course, which then is keeping all of them updated at the exact same time. Time And so now you have real time information that's able to come through a lot faster and a lot more succinctly. Um, this is because our architecture allows for this through our list managers and schema managers in which you can build anything at all. For example, we can have schemas that are about the digital assets and have all of the information you need, but we can also have end number of collection objects types, whether they be fine art, furniture, natural history, whatever you collect. Heck, we have hip hop museums using Torrencia as that example. It doesn't matter. It could be marine museums. It doesn't really matter what it is. Even at the moat, they actually have organisms. 
an encyclopedia records of each different type of living species that they have. If you join Cleveland uh, a little bit later, you're going to find out how they have almost 15 different organizations with inside of Terencia, all with different um, object information and asset information as well because of that schema type. By the way, um, you will you could go into our exhibit booth and find a, um, a case study about Cleveland if you're interested um, to see that today. Um, schemas as well, so being able to create all of these across any sub schemas that are needed. So whether it be having an archives, an exhibition, a library, the rights, the entire thing, and then being able to manage the views because not everybody wants all of that data that comes over in this integration to be able to see by everybody. And finally, the reward, the payoff, right, that comes with this is then because of our integration, what we're able to do is to be able to see um, a, a really good view. The reward is that kind of global search view that comes over top of all of this. Uh, being able to search across them all from one point, even though you may still have all of these different systems, but being able to see across the data and all of those connections that come with it. And that's what's really important for all of us today. So. Um, a few questions uh, that we have coming in, um, and I encourage anybody else to to encourage uh, uh, you to have any questions. We wanted to leave time because we knew that APIs and how does the sim work and, and these kind of things are complicated. Rob, one that comes up all the time, right, is the cost of an institution trying to do this themselves, yeah. right? I'm sure that you face this all the time. Can you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of what happens when an institution is trying to build or maintain their own API? Yeah, of course. I mean, the, one of the one of the things that kind of often gets overlooked in in these situations is that the the cost of building things yourself internally um, is the cost of continually maintaining continuity, staff continuity making sure that all the time there are multiple people who know how to look after these things. Because how many times do institutions get people who have really in real deep interests in these areas that get, get deep into the systems and start working with them and kind of get to a level of knowledge, which is kind of, you know, stands out within a particular institution. And, and then that person leaves. And then there's kind of very little continuity or when things like versions of systems change um, or, um you know, systems change internally or personnel leave. So you kind of, when, when you're looking at the at those ongoing costs versus the costs of software, then you kind of have to take into account longevity as well and whose responsibility it is to keep things running, keep things going and maintain that continuity. So it, even though, you know, ostensibly, if at any given time you've got people who are, you know, who, who may well be competent and capable of building these things. What you have to ask yourself is, are you always going to have those people? Are those people always going to be there? And what will you do when things change? So, you know, there's obviously always multiple ways of looking at these problems, but I think it's always important to take the longer term view as well, because quite often institutions, once they make decisions, they, uh, they stay with them for a long time. So you're having to kind of maintain those integrations internally. Rob, would you mind just talking a little bit about um, your process um, as you go through this, so this extraction? How long does yeah. that usually take on average, and what is your process that goes with it? Um, do, is there a cleanup that gets to be involved, or, or what happens along the way? Yeah, so basically um, the system um, runs a predetermined schedule, the process. We, we, we have lots of uh, integrations um, with systems already. Obviously, in, in a lot of a lot of situations, uh, collections of management systems have common fields and common data, and then a certain amount of configurable fields and configurable data. So you kind of have standard integrations that you can do, and then you need to extend those, you know, in slightly custom ways to deal with those extensible fields that are used in different ways. Uh, the system kind of works with that data, brings the data through, and then it just performs incremental updates. But obviously, one of the key things that's problematic in these situations is when deletions happen in source systems and making sure those things stay in sync. So where the systems support those things, we can kind of run audits against them and make sure that the system, that, that the references we have um, are still in step. There's no hard deletes being run. So the process is one of incremental 
uh, updates on a daily or hourly or 15 minute, however, however synchronous it wants to be. And then periodic full audits where we go back and make sure that, that things haven't been bulk deleted um, uh, that have just essentially disappeared from the system. So the process of one is one of continuous incremental and then periodic auditing, because the key thing here as well is to make sure everything's audited, to make sure that you're very sure that at any given time you've got exactly um, the data in the integration that is in the source systems. That's great, Rob. We've had a few more questions come in. This is, for timing, I'm going to combine a couple of, of them together. One was around taxonomy as well as subsets of data and how does, Tran, how does Trencia use this. I was going to use one that we did recently together where, um, you know, through um, the SIM, um, Rob was able to pull the data out, um, but in their core collections management system, they were actually just using a free text field where really they wanted to use a controlled vocabulary list. And what we were able to do is bring that out and start to transform it into a vocabulary list that was, you know, that was a, a very defined one that they could then select from or that we could match to um, along the way. And at Terencia, actually, when it comes to metadata, we're open. Uh, we really start with three fields and then whatever schema, whatever whatever um, a standard that you want to follow or deviations of those standards that you want to follow, um, you can do so. Um, there was another really great question, Rob, about uh, specifically about and something that we were just talking about actually this morning, uh, which has to do with vocabularies and dictionaries. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so can you pull it out to can you use the SIM to help with vocabularies or dictionaries um, along the way? Yeah, you absolutely can. And I think it's worth remembering that one of the things that is, has been a continuous, well, I won't say problem, but that it's a continuous talking point, which is more often than not um, the terminology that's used to classify and manage the classification of collections is not necessarily the same terminology that people who are not collections management people would use to try and find them. So obviously there are two parts to this. There's making sure that you can properly manage the control vocabularies and make sure that those stay controlled and that they can be managed and handled and potentially extended. But the other thing as well is also being able to transform and align those potentially with more user friendly uh, terminology sets that can be used to kind of more easily collect non-specialist and specific users with the data. So to make sure you can do things like reclassify the content on the way through against, uh, you know, maybe more of the words that people might use to find them. So there are both sides. There's the benefits of the management of the control vocabularies, which is absolutely key, and making sure those persist through the system, but also being able to use those to apply different sets of terminologies that expand and enhance the usability. Excellent. Thank you, Rob. Um, one last question that came up as well during uh, during the session was um, the the first one, the first example that you were talking about. Uh, the question was asked, are those records or books that were being done and are they cataloged? Um, sorry, the, the in the in the example. Yeah, it said it, the question was, are those records or books and are they catalogs? It was pretty early yeah. in it. So I, 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 yeah, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm presuming that, that, that uh, if I understand right, that's probably talking about the fact that it may be a library management system um, that's kind of bringing in mark data or library systems. Um, and so, yes, I mean, the, the system works across uh, library collections, archival authority, dams. So, you know, we, we can kind of model data as books and pages as well as, um, you know, single objects uh, or groups of objects, things like that. Uh, I, if I understand the question correctly, apologies if I've misunderstood it. Oh, no problem. I, I It was a little bit tough and I apologize if we didn't um, and didn't hit that um, properly. Um, we're at the end of the session now, but um, as Hannah pointed out, there's the Huntington, but I also would encourage you to go and see the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, which I believe is also on um, right now. Um, and Haley, who's over there, she's doing amazing work um, about it and, and one of the Trencia community members. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and sorry for those who we didn't get to um, we didn't get to answer. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like, you can email us directly. Um, you can find us here, obviously, in the platform or come by the exhibition booth. We're more than happy to answer questions there. Rob, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you had fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you.
Great. Thanks, everybody. And uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Don't forget about uh, Haley at Cleveland and then the moat uh, back for their third time in four years to talk about their damn journey as well.